will come. And they all went home and had sardines on toast for dinner. The end. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It is only the beginning of a new story. Do you like the bow tie? I thought to myself, I got the most views last Friday for wearing a bow tie. Has it got anything to do with a bow tie? Who knows? Maybe it doesn't. Or maybe it does. I'm going to test it. And also I think we're starting a new story, so I should wear a bow tie at the beginning and the end of every story. Oh, yes. So today, as you can see from the title, we are back in C.S. Lewis world. That's right. We are reading Prince Caspian. Oh, yeah. Could have got myself a little series going on. And I'm back with a massive book that's bigger than my head. Woo. Yeah. Cool. We're back with our lovable characters, Peter, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy. Yeah. Cool. I've been doing this for a while now. In fact, I was just thinking about the stories that I've been doing. I've done uh, four stories and some other things by now, each taking two weeks, which means it's taken about eight weeks, which means we've been in lockdown for more than eight weeks. <gasps> yeah. So at least I get to do this. I've done, I have done The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I've done Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, I've done James in the Giant Peach, and I've done Charlie in the Great Glass Elevator, and now we start a new story. So if you want to go and find another story, let's get rid of that fan. Then do please follow the link, which I will post afterwards. Now you're going to sit there, you're going to stay? Stay? Yeah. Just check the screen's all good. Right, so, let's dive into this new story. Prince Caspian. In fact, I might post this picture for you all to see. These are the lands of Narnia for this story. Oh, and some of the characters. I'll try my best to show you the pictures. Right. So, this is written by C.S. Lewis. Prince Caspian, Chapter One. The Island. There were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And it has been told in another book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe how they had a remarkable adventure. They had opened the door of a magic wardrobe and found themselves in quite a different world from ours. And in that different world, they'd become kings and queens in a country called Narnia. While they were in Narnia, they seemed to reign for years and years. But when they came back through the door and found themselves in England again, England, it all seemed to have taken no time at all. At any rate, no one noticed that they'd ever been away. And they never told anyone, except for one very wise grown-up. This had all happened years ago now, in fact, a year ago, and now all four of them were sitting on a seat at a railway station, with trunks and play boxes piled round them. They were, in fact, on their way back to school, Girl. which is more that can be said for some people. They travelled together as far as this station, which was a junction, and here, in a few minutes, one train would arrive and take the girls away to one school. Oh. And in about half an hour, another train would arrive and the boys would go off to another school. That's quite sad. The first part of the journey, when they were all together, always seemed to be part of the holidays. But now, when they would soon be saying goodbye and going different ways, everyone felt that the holidays were really over. And everyone felt their term time feeling beginning again. And they were all rather gloomy. And no one could think of anything to say. Lucy was going to boarding school for the first time. It was an empty, sleepy country station, and there there's hardly anyone on the platform except themselves. Suddenly, Lucy gave a sharp little cry, like someone who'd been stung by a wasp. Ah! What's up, Lou? said Edmund, and then suddenly broke off and made a noise like, Ow! What on earth? began Peter, and then he too suddenly changed what he was going to say and said, he said, Susan, let go! What are you doing? Where are you dragging me to? to? I, I'm not touching you, said Susan. Someone's pulling me. My wife's using the blender. Hang on, let me go and shut the door. Can you close the door, please? Can you close the door, please? <laughs> she's, she's wearing headphones and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm being loud. It's fine, and I got some water. Water is always good for when you're eating. Okay. Let's carry on. Right. What did Susan say? I'm not touching you, said Susan. Someone's pulling me. Oh, ow. Oh, stop it. Everyone noticed 
all the others' faces had gone very white. I felt just the same, said Edmund in a breathless voice, as if I'd, as if I'd been dragged along a most frightful pulling. Ugh, it's beginning again. Me too, said Lucy. Oh, I can't bear it. Look sharp, shouted Edmund. All catch hands and keep together. This is magic. I can tell by the feeling. Quick! Yes, said Susan. I'll hold hands. Oh, I do wish it would stop. Oh! Next moment, the luggage, the seats, the platform and the train station had completely vanished. The four children, holding hands, and all panting, found themselves standing in a woody place. Such a woody place that the branches were sticking into them, and there was hardly any room to move. They rubbed their eyes and took a deep breath. <gasps> oh, Peter! exclaimed Lucy. Do you think we could possibly have gone back to Narnia? It might be anywhere, said Peter. I can't see a yard in all these trees. Let's try to get into the open, if there is an open. With some difficulty, and with some strings, with some stings, sorry, from some nettles and pricks from the thorns, they struggled out of the thicket. Then they had another surprise. Everything became much brighter, and after a few steps they found themselves at the edge of the wood, looking down on a sandy beach. A few yards away, a very calm sea was falling on the sand, with such tiny ripples that it hardly made any sound. There was no land in sight, and no clouds in the sky. The sun was about where it ought to be at ten o'clock in the morning, and the sea was a dazzling blue. They stood sniffing the sea smell. Oh, I should stop talking about the beach. It's a bank holiday. We should all be at the beach, shouldn't we? No, we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Unless you're already there. By Jove, said Peter. This is good enough. Five minutes later, everyone was barefooted and wading in the cool, clear water. Well, this is better than being on a stuffy train on the way back, way back to Latin and French and algebra, said Edmund. And then for quite a long time, there was no more talking, only slashing and looking for shrimps and crabs. All the same, said Susan presently, I suppose we'll have to make some plans. We shall want something to eat before long. We've got the sandwiches Mother gave us for the journey, said Edmund. At least I've got mine. Not me, said Lucy. Mine were in my little bag. So were mine, said Susan. Oh, uh, mine are in my coat pocket. They're on the beach, said Peter. There'll be two lunches among four. This isn't going to be such fun. At present, said Lucy, I want something to drink more than something to eat. Everyone else now, now felt thirsty, as one usually does, after wading in the salt water in the hot, under a hot sun. But don't drink the seawater! <laughs> ah! <clears throat> it's, it's like being shipwrecked, remarked Edmund. In the books, they always find springs of clear, fresh water on the island. we better go and look for them. Ah! Uh, does that mean we have to go all the way back into the thick of the wood? said Susan. Not a bit of it, said Peter. If there are streams, they're bound to come down to the sea, and if we walk along the beach, we're bound to come to them. They all now waded back and went first across the smooth, wet sand, and then up to the dry, crumbly sand that sticks to one's toes, and began putting on their shoes and socks. Edmund and Lucy wanted to leave them behind and do their exploring with bare feet, but Susan said this would be a mad thing to do. We might never find them again, she pointed out, and we should want them if we're still here when night comes and it begins to be cold. When they were dressed again, they set out along the shore with the sea on their left hand and the wood on their right. Except for the occasional seagull, it was very quiet. The wood was so thick and tangled that they could hardly see into it at all, and nothing in it moved, not a, not a bird, not even an insect. Shells and sea seaweed and <gasps> anemones, I hope that's how you pronounce it, or tiny crabs in rock pools. They're all very well, but you soon get tired of them if you're thirsty. The children's feet, after the change from the cool water, felt hot and heavy. Susan and Lucy had raincoats to carry. Edmund had put down his coat on the station seat just before the magic overtook them, and he and Peter took it in turns to carry Peter's greatcoat. He's got a great coat. Yeah. Presently, the shore began to curve round to the right. About a quarter of an hour later, after they crossed a rocky ridge, which ran out in, into a point, it made quite a sharp turn. Their backs were now to the part of the sea which had met them when they first came out of the wood, and now looking ahead they could see across the water another shore, thickly wooded, like the one they were exploring. I wonder, 
Is that an island, or do we join onto it presently? said Lucy. Don't know, said Peter, as they all plodded along in silence. The shore that they were walking on drew nearer and nearer to the opposite shore, and as they came round, each promontory the children expected to find the place where the two had joined. But in this they were disappointed. They came to some rocks, which they had to climb, and from the top they could see a fair way ahead. And, oh, bother, said Edmund. It's no good. We shan't be able to get to those other woods at all. We're on an island. And here's a picture. Oh, this book is so hefty. Oh. I know it looks like I'm dressed smart, but I'm actually wearing some really skanky shorts. Look at them. <laughs> anyway, I'm not supposed to do that. <clears throat> I'm dressed fully smart. It was true. At this point, the channel between them and the opposite coast was about 30 or 40 yards wide, but they could now see that this was at its narrowest place. After that, their own coast bent round to the right again, and they could see open sea between it and the mainland. It was obvious that they'd already come much more than halfway around the island. Look, said Lucy suddenly. What's that? She pointed to a long, silvery, snake-like thing that lay across the beach. A stream! A stream! shouted the others. Then, tired as they were, they lost no time in clattering down the rocks and racing to the fresh water. They knew that the stream would be better to drink further up, away from the beach, so they went at once to the spot where it came out of the wood. The trees were as thick as ever, but the stream had made itself a deep course between high mossy banks, so that by stooping you could follow it up in a sort of tunnel of leaves. They dropped on their knees by the first brown dimply pool and drank and drank, and dipped their faces in the water and then dipped in their arms up to the elbows. Now, said Edmund, what about those sandwiches? Mm. All this took on the water to make me thirsty. Oh, hadn't we better save them? said Susan. We may, we may need them far worse later on. I do wish, said Lucy, now that we're not thirsty, we could go on feeling as not hungry as we did when we were thirsty. Who? Mm. Well, but what about those sandwiches? repeated Edmund. There's no good saving them till they go bad. You've got to remember it's a good deal hotter here than in England, and we've been carrying them about in our pockets for hours. So they got out the two packets and divided them into four portions, and nobody had quite enough, but it was a great deal better than nothing. Then they talked about their plans for the next meal. Lucy wanted to go back into the sea and catch shrimps, until someone pointed out that they had no nets. Edmund said they must gather gulls' eggs from the rocks. But when they came to think of it, they couldn't remember having seen any gulls' eggs and wouldn't be able to cook them if they found any. Peter thought to himself that unless they had some stroke of luck, they would soon be glad to eat eggs raw, but he didn't see any point in saying this out loud. Susan said it was a pity that they'd eaten the sandwiches so soon. One or two tempers very nearly got lost at this stage. Finally, Edmund said, Look here! The only thing that's to be done, there's only one thing, we must explore the wood. Hermits and knight errants and people like that always manage to live somehow if they're in a forest. They find roots and berries and things. What sort of roots? asked Susan. I always thought it meant roots of trees, said Lucy. Come on, said Peter. Ed is right. And we must try to do something. And it'll be better than going out into the glare of the sun again. So they all got up and began to follow the stream. It was very hard work. They had to stoop under branches and climb over branches, and they blundered through great masses of stuff like rhododendrons and tore their clothes and got their feet wet in the stream, and still there was no noise at all except the noise of the stream and the noises they were making themselves. They were beginning to get very tired when they noticed a delicious smell and then a flash of bright colour high above them at the top of the right bank. I say, exclaimed Lucy, I do believe there's an apple tree. It was. They panted up the steep bank forced their way through some brambles and found themselves standing right round an old tree that was heavy with large yellowish golden apples as firm and as juicy as you could wish to see. And this is not the only tree, said Edmund, with his mouth full of apple. Look, there and there. Why, there are dozens of them, said Susan, picking away the core of her first apple, throwing it away, sorry, and picking her second. This must have been an orchard long, long ago. Perhaps before the place went wild and the woods grew up. Then this was once an inhabited island, said Peter. And what's that, said Lucy, pointing ahead. By Jove, it's a wall, said Peter, an old stone wall. Picture time! Hey! 
There you go. Pressing their way between the laden branches, they reached the wall. It was very old and broken down in places, with moss and wallflowers growing on it, but it was higher than all but the tallest trees. And when they came quite close to it, they found a great arch, which must have, must have once had a gate in it, but was now almost filled up with the largest of all the apple trees. They had to break some of the branches to get past, and when they'd done so, they all blinked because the daylight became suddenly much brighter. They found themselves in a wide open place with walls all around it. In here there were no trees, only level grass and daisies and ivy and grey walls. It was a bright, secret, secret, quiet place, and rather sad. And all four stepped into the middle of it, glad to be able to straighten their backs and move their limbs freely. Thanks, Mervid. What can I say? Chapter 2. Now, I forgot to say at the beginning, this book is 15 chapters long, and I'm going to do it in 10 days. So 10 divided by 15 is one and a half. So I'm going to do one and a half chapters per day. We're doing well. Chapter 2. The Ancient Treasure House. This wasn't a garden, said Susan presently. It was a castle, and this must have been the courtyard. I see what you mean, said Peter. Yes, that is the remains of a tower. And there is what used to be a flight of steps going up to the top of the walls. And look at those other steps, the broad, shallow ones, going up to that doorway. It must have been the door into the great hall. Ages ago, by the looks of it, said Edmund. Yes, ages ago, said Peter. I wish we could find out who the people were that lived in this castle, and how long ago. It gives me quite a queer feeling, said Lucy. Does it, Lou? said Peter, turning and looking hard at her. Because it does the same to me. It's the queerest thing that has happened this queer day. I feel where we are. I wonder what it all means. While they were talking, they had crossed the, cro crossed the courtyard and gone through the other doorway into what had once been the hall. This was now very like the courtyard, for the roof had long since disappeared, and it was merely another space of grass and daisy daisies, except that it was shorter and narrower, and the walls were higher. Across the far end there was a kind of terrace, about three feet higher than the rest. I wonder, was it really the hall? said Susan. What is that terrace kind of thing? Why, you silly, said Peter, who had become strangely excited. Don't you see? That was the dais where the high table was, where the king and the great lords sat. Anyone would think you'd forgotten that we ourselves were once kings and queens and sat on a dais just like that. Is it Deus, kind of pronounce it, Deus. In our great hall. In our castle of Care Paravel, continued Susan, in a dreamy and rather sing-song voice. At the mouth of the great river of Narnia. How could I forget? How it all comes back, said Lucy. We could pretend we were in Care Paravel now. This hall must have been very, very like the great hall we feasted in. But unfortunately, without the feast, said Edmund. Yeah, it's getting late, you know. Look how long the shadows are, and have you noticed that it's not so hot? Mm, we shall need a campfire if we've got to spend the night here, said Peter. I've got matches. Let's go and see if we can collect some dry wood. Everyone saw the sense of this, and for the next half an hour they were busy. The orchard through which they had first come into the ruins turned out not to be good. Not to be a good place for firewood. They tried the other side of the castle, passing out of the hall, by a little side door, into a maze of stony humps and hollows, which must have, once, must once have been passages and smaller rooms, but was now all nettles and wild roses. Hang on a second. <coughs> Beyond this, they found a wide gap in the castle wall and stepped through it into a wood of darker and bigger trees, where they found dead branches and rotten wood and sticks and dry leaves and fir cones aplenty. They went to and fro with bundles until they had a good pile on the dais. <laughs> My homework is to uh, research how to pronounce dais. On the fifth journey, they found the well, just outside the hall, hidden in weeds, but clean and fresh and deep when they had cleared these away. The remains of a stone pavement ran halfway round it, and the girls went out to pick some more apples, and the boys built the fire on the dais, and fairly closer to the corner between two walls, which they thought would be a snuggest and warmest place. They had great difficulty in lighting it, and used a lot of matches, but they succeeded in the end. Obviously they didn't go to boys' brigade, am I right? <laughs> or scouts. Or, yeah. Finally, all four sat down with their backs to the wall and their faces to the fire. They tried roasting some of the apples on the ends of sticks, 
The roast apples are not good without sugar, and they're all too hot to eat with your fingers till they're too cold to be worth eating. So they had to be content with the raw apples. Which, as Edmund said, made one realise that school suppers weren't so bad after all. Oh, I shouldn't mind a good thick slice of bread and margarine this minute, he added. But the spirit of adventure was rising in them all, and no one really wanted to be back at school. Shortly after the last apple had been eaten, Susan went out to the well to get another drink. When she came back, she was carrying something in her hand. Look, she said, in a rather choking sort of voice. I found it by the well, she said. She handed it to Peter and sat down. The others thought she looked looked and sounded, as if she might be going to cry. Emma and Lucy eagerly bent forward to see what was in Peter's hand. A little bright thing that gleamed in the firelight. Well, I'm, I'm jiggered, said Peter, and his voice also sounded queer. Then he handed it to the others. Here's another picture. There are nice pictures in this. I hope you can see it well enough. Remember, you can always pause it. And now, all now saw what it was. A little chest knight. Ordinary in size, but extraordinarily heavy, because it was made of pure gold. Ooh. And the eyes in the, ho in the horse's head were two tiny little rubies. One, or rather what one was, for the other had been knocked out. Why, said Lucy, it's exactly like one of the golden chessmen we used to play with when we were kings and queens at Care Paravel. Cheer up, Sue, said Peter to his other sister. I can't help it, said Susan. It brought back oh, such lovely times. And I remember playing chess with fawns and good giants and the mer people singing in the sea and my beautiful horse and... And now, said Peter in quite a different voice, it's about time we four started using our brains. What about, said Edmund. Have none of you guessed where we are, said Peter. Go on, go on, said Lucy. I felt for hours that there was some wonderful mystery hanging over this place. Far ahead, Peter, said Edmund. We're all listening. We are in the ruins of Care Paravel itself, said Peter. But, I say, replied Edmund. I mean, how did you make that one out? This place has been ruined for ages. Look at all those big trees growing right up to the gates. Look at the very stones. Anyone can see that nobody's lived here for hundreds of years. I know, said Peter. That is the difficulty. But let's, let's leave that out for a moment. I want to take the points one by one. First point. This hall is exactly the same shape and size as the hall at Care Paravel. Just picture a roof on this, and a coloured pavement instead of grass, and tapestries on the walls, and you get our royal banqueting hall. No one said anything. Second point, continued Peter. The castle well is exactly where our, our well was, a little to the south of the Great Hall, and it's exactly the same size and shape. Again, there was no reply. Third point. Susan has just found one of our old chessmen, or something like one of them, as two peas. Something as like one of them as two peas. Still, nobody answered. Fourth point. Do you remember? It was the very day before the ambassadors came from the king of Kalorman. Don't you remember planting the orchard outside the north gates of Care Paravel? The greatest of all the wood people, Pomona herself, came to put good spells on it. It was those very decent little chaps, the moles, who did the actual digging. Can you have forgotten that funny old lily gloves, the chief mole, leaning on his spade and saying, Believe me, your majesty, you'll be glad of these fruit trees one day. And by Jove, he was right. Oh, I do, I do, said Lucy, and clapped her hands. <coughs> but look here, Peter, said Edmund. This must all be rot. To begin with, we didn't plant the orchard slap up against the gate. We wouldn't have been such fools. No, of course not, said Peter, but it has grown up to the gate since. And for another thing, said Edmund, Care Paravel wasn't on an island. Yes, I've been wondering about that, but it was a, uh, what do you call it, uh, a peninsula. Jolly nearly an island. Jolly nearly an island. Couldn't it have been made an island since our time? Somebody has dug a channel. They look at half a moment, said Edmund. You keep on saying, since our time. But it's only a year ago since we came back from Narnia. And you want to make out that in one year castles have fallen down and great forests have grown up and little trees we saw planted outside have turned into a big old orchard. And goodness knows what else. It's all impossible. There's one thing, said Lucy. If this is Care Paravel, there ought to be a door at the end of the dais. 
Well, that's how you pronounce it, dais, I think. Yeah. In fact, we ought to be sitting with our backs against it at this moment. You know, the, the door that led down to our treasure chamber. I suppose there isn't a door, said Peter, getting up. The wall behind them was a mass of ivy. We can soon find out, said Edmund, taking up one of the sticks that they'd laid ready for putting on the fire. He began beating the ivied wall. Tap, tap, went the stick, went the stick against the stone. And again, tap, tap. And then, all at once, boom, boom. With quite a different... <laughs> his basil brush. Boom, boom. Sorry. With quite a different sound. A hollow wooden sound. Great Scott, said Edmund. We must clear this, clear this ivy away, said Peter. Oh, do let's leave it alone, said Susan. We can try it in the morning. If we've got to spend the night here, I don't want an open door at my back and a great big black hole that anything might come out of beside the, dra besides the draught and the damp. And it'll soon be dark. Susan, how can you? said Lucy with a reproachful glance. Both boys were too much excited to take any notice of Susan's advice. Absolutely. They worked at the ivy with their hands and with Peter's pocket knife till the knife broke. After that, they used Edmunds. Soon the whole place where they'd been sitting was covered with ivy. And at last, they had the door cleared. Locked, of course, said Peter. And that is where I'm going to leave it for today. Oh, <laughs> I like these cliffhangers. <sighs> Do comment if you watch this video because I'm wearing a bow tie. Or if you watch it because you want to listen to the story. Yay. Marvellous. Well then, page 222. That should be easy to remember. Half past five tomorrow. You'll have to come back and find out how do they open the locked door. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, and I'm going to post a link in the comments to my YouTube channel where all of the other stories are now listed perfectly and neatly. With special little pictures and descriptions of the, of the uh, chapters as well. Marvellous. And do me one final favour, please, on this Bank Holiday Monday. I'm asking my friends a favour, thank you! Would you mind sharing this video on Facebook? Or anywhere else? Thank you for watching. See you tomorrow at half past five. God bless you all.